So hi, thanks for coming to my talk. Apologies if you didn't manage to get a seat. Um, hopefully it's, it's, it will be as exciting as it sounds. Um, I went to the keynotes this morning and um, it's a bit terrifying following a opening keynote where the, um, the speaker tries to get you to be like humorous and stuff. So hopefully it'll be a bit funny. There's some funny stories. Um, I'm a tech principal at ThoughtWorks. So some people might know what that means. Um, some people might not. It means I'm still technical but I kind of get involved in other stuff. So I still occasionally get to write code, but not as much as I'd like. That's possibly my failing. But I do architecture, I do DDD. I've done Scala, wasted five years of my life doing some Scala. Um, and lots of other stuff. This talk isn't about technical stuff, but it is a talk about non-technical stuff for technical people. So it's by us for us. That's the theory. Um, that's my Twitter handle. It's on, I'm gonna try. My personal goal is to not stand behind the podium for the whole talk. So you can tell me later on if I have. Um, but I'd love to like talk about this kind of stuff because I'm trying to pull together bits which I've seen in lots of different places which I don't necessarily think you see at many conferences, which hopefully is interesting. If you, want, if you have opinions, like good or bad or anything, um, please tweet me at my not very memorable Twitter handle and then we can like have a chat about it or find me afterwards because I'm here for the rest of the conference. Um, so yeah, let's go. So this is, this is a... Something I posted in, in very small writing on Facebook sometime in 2014 before I deleted my Facebook account. Um, I posted it privately because I loved privacy before um, Facebook figured out it was a good thing. Um, but it was after one of the first times when I'd been involved in a project where I wasn't just writing code and I wasn't just kind of shipping features. So I'd had to, even though I was a developer from a development background, I'd ended up um, doing human-based stuff. It's a bit terrifying. I tried to avoid doing much of that as possible for the entire of my career. Um, and what was surprising to me was it was almost as much fun as shipping code. So the kind of the, 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 the hit, the feeling of um, success that I got from like m doing things with other people was as almost as good as like when you see your feature running in prod and you can like, you know, use it. Um, that was a quote from me. This is, that's not the right way to start a talk. The right way to start a talk is from a famous quote from a famous person. So this is, I don't know if Eli Goldratt is still alive, but there is a Twitter account which tweets quotes from Eli Goldratt on the internet. Um, so this is an Eli Goldratt quote. And so this is something which, after um, having done dev for 15, 16 years, professionally being paid for it, made me really stop and think. So it's kind of three bits. Features have no value unless they're in the hands of a user and being used for productive effort. So that made me think about all the stuff, the code I'd written in the past. Um, any activity not spent getting the next most valuable feature into the hands of a user quickly is just waste. So I thought about all of the products which I'd worked on which had never shipped. I thought about all of the features which had kind of, we'd shipped but then we retired. I thought about all of the features that we'd shipped and nobody used. And I thought about all the time we spent talking about things that we never kind of decided to build or anything. I thought, you know, it made me think a lot about what I've done, but also the teams I've worked on have done, but also like just our industry as a whole, right? Um, and so sometimes, I've done this for a long time, so sometimes we're not as good as we could be. So this made me stop and think a lot. Um, so then, but after, as, as, you know, I had this uh, a micro moment where I thought it might be my fault, but then I thought it can't be my fault, so I must be have to find someone else to blame. Um, luckily, there's loads of people in software development to blame, right? And especially as developers, we love blaming people who aren't developers, so we could blame Scrum Masters because they're probably must be at fault somewhere. Um, we could blame QAs because they like we write good features and they test them and tell it where they're not good features. Um, BAs, because have like BAs, they just they're like failed developers, right? So um, <laughs> and and like project managers, they are the worst. So, but even like if you want to go really like properly level things up to blame people, middle management are a classic group to blame. You could change career and you can still blame middle management. Or the execs, right? Executive management. But it's definitely people. We should definitely blame people. Apart from the fact that blaming people doesn't necessarily get us to the right place, right? So typically, the best kind of blaming ends up with a scapegoat, and if you're really lucky, they'll end up tied to a stake, like on fire, and you're waving a pitchfork or something, right? So that's, you know, so maybe that's not the right thing to do. But the kind of, the, the, the Eli Goldreich quote still definitely stands, right? This definitely feels like a lot of waste in what we do. You know, the, the, collabor the co correlation between my productive output and like value is probably not massively correlated. But we're not alone in knowing this, right? We're not just 
developers aren't the only people who, um, who know about this and moan about it constantly, all the time, every day, even when we're at home, when we're not working. Other people know this too. So the biggest people who probably know it are middle management and senior management and execs, right? So they're sitting there going, this is inefficient. We seem to be paying these expensive developers loads of money. They built a load of stuff which never shipped because it was a dead project for all this kind of stuff. And so what they try and do is senior and middle management will typically have a transformation, right, because they love transformations, or they will do like an agile transformation. We've all probably had an agile transformation. That's always typically a good thing to do. Um, or you can have an adoption of something like DevOps adoption, right? Most people in the audience are probably if not currently adopting DevOps as a practice, have adopted DevOps as a practice, in inverted commas, um, or someone is thinking about making you adopt DevOps as a practice. And so these, the basic motivations are not bad, right? Agile is awesome, and for thought works, I'd get, get taken out and shot if I didn't think Agile was awesome. DevOps is definitely the, you know, a fundamentally amazing thing to do. Um, however, I'm going to argue here, and it doesn't mean it's always bad, but I'm going to argue polemically that it's typically bad, Transformations like this that are opposed from the top down fail. They fail because they're massive and stop the world. They're like big design up front, right? This is what, we're gonna, what we look like now. This is where we're going to go to. Um, they are um, super expensive. They are kind of one size fits all. They typically kind of lose the nuance and the subtlety as you're going, and they end up just being like, we definitely need more Jenkins. If we're going to be DevOps, we'll have more Jenkins and we'll probably have a builds dashboard or radiator or something, right? And Agile, we need Scrum Masters, so we'll hire more Scrum Masters. Um, so while they're motivated, they come from a good place, they don't necessarily always kind of meet their goals. And I would argue lots of times they don't meet their goals for millions of different reasons. So then I read another book. Um, so this is a book, and there's a book reading list at the end of this presentation for anyone who um, wants to take one single photograph. Um, this is a book, a quote from the book, the Fifth Discipline by Peter Senge. And it's actually where the word is learning organization. So when HR people use the word learning organization at you, this is where it comes from. Um, but he said, and this was based after a lot of research, a lot of observation, not just in IT, in like loads and loads of different industries. Placed in the same system, people tend to produce similar results. So we've probably seen this, right? You know, you're like a high-performing team, and one person leaves because they get a better job. They go to DevOps, they find a better company to work for, they leave. You hire a new person, and they join the team. The team's probably, you know what I mean? It's not like very, very, very infrequently do you lose the star performer and the whole thing falls apart. And in my experience, if you lose the star performer and everything falls apart, then there was a bigger problem. You know, you, it was a bunch of people kind of getting coffee for, for one person who was writing code, who may not be writing the best code in the world, as opposed to a high-performing team, right? So you can take people in, you can take people out. And the same is equally true for like bad, mal-performing systems. So I'd seen this, you know, especially because I'm a consultant, so I move around and I see lots of different places and lots of different things. And you see other people, you know, they're in a team and they're not very productive, and then they move to another team, and then suddenly they're a star, and people are like, why is this person awesome? So I thought, so there must be, you know, this, with kind of this extra new information, how do we fix this problem which we have of waste, not being super efficient, not getting, you know, I've, being selfish, I want to maximize my, um, like, the dopamine hit of shipping good features. So how am I going to ship more features, right? So how do, I fix, how do we fix it? So I reckon we can fix it. So this is where you might like recoil in terror. There's quite a safety net in if you're a developer and you know things are wrong, but you don't want to have to take responsibility for fixing it. Because if it's a defect, you can fix it in code, right? If it's a human problem, then you need to like talk to other people to fix that human problem. And you need to influence people. And you need to understand motivations and balance and compromise and all that kind of stuff. And it's not necessarily like code. But I think it is. So that's what I'm going to argue in this talk. I think makers, so not just developers, but like BAs, QAs, kind of people down at the ground floor, people working with these systems, we're the best suited to do this. And so I'm going to make three statements, which I hopefully you can keep in mind as we go through the talk. And I'm going to hopefully give you some suggestions and some ways of approaching these things to make this come to life. So the three statements are as follows. Number one, Organizational structure is best served by being in a constant state of incremental change. If that feels like refactoring, right? Big, massive refactorings of code bases always fail, right? Not always. 99.95% of the time, you've got into a mess that you shouldn't have got into in the first place. So this is the same thing. You're like your biannual reorg or like redundancies or whatever. 
is a, is, is, a, is a blunt instrument to fix a problem where you should be slowly, incrementally, gradually changing things just like code, right? So we should get used to it, because we are in, in, in dev world. You know, it's not just me that writes the code. Everyone writes the code. So that's good. So that's part one. Part two, the best people to make these changes are the people who have the maximum context, the people on the receiving end of them. That's us, right? The people who are making stuff. But that's not the only reason why we should be the people who are best placed to do this, because it's number three. I reckon, and that's what I'm going to argue in the next, the rest of the presentation, our skills that we have as developers and QAs and BAs and other people who work in the software de delivery and development industry, we're really good at lots of the skills you need to do all this stuff. So now we get to the refactoring and hacking. So I have pulled out, there's a load of stuff. So I got really carried away with this because I'm a developer. Um, there's tons of stuff in this area. And this is just like five key things that I pulled out because they seemed, A, I could come up with cool names for them. So you'll see the cool names coming up. So the theory is you'll remember the cool names and then you'll have like a mental framework to kind of approach this for in the future. Um, but these, I think, these are the ones that I've kind of used myself to try and make changes and drive changes and improve things. So therefore, I can tell you stories about how they've worked as opposed to just reading off quotes from books. But also, um, I can tell you stories of... Um, there's a, I want to change, the, change around things around slightly. Most of the talks you will go to at this conference, people will tell you about stories, and then the, in the story, some of the actors in the story will be developers. They'll be in the story, and you will relate to that as, oh, I can relate to this because I'm the person who'd be doing this thing. I'm not going to do that. I could tell you stories about that, and if you want to hear about them, I can um, send you them on Twitter. But what the stories I'm going to tell are where the developers and the makers are the clients, the customers of the story. So therefore, you take yourself out of the story and you can see it from a different perspective because that's what I want us to do. I want us to kind of look at things from a different perspective. So each of these will have a story, but the story will be you will be a consumer. You won't be doing the doing. So without further ado, we're going to get to number one, maps human architecture. So map human architecture, this is something we all do, but we do it in code all the time. I do it a lot because I'm a software um, consultant. So I go to a new client and they'll go, there's a bunch of stuff and there's a bunch of code over here and there's three, these three kind of source control systems. And they, you know, can you figure out, do a, you know, either do a um, review of what we've got or just kind of figure out how with a quick way to kind of transform it to microservices or whatever, right? So you go in, you look at the code base. All of us will have skills for figuring out the kind of the key structure of a code base. Number one, it's not documentation, because the documentation either doesn't exist or is out of date. Or is wrong, which is worse, right? <coughs> so we have other, other skills, and the skill is not check out all the code, start at the first you know, class alphabetically, at the top of that class in the first alphabetically ordered package and read down from the top. There's other mechanisms we use. So we do this all the time, you know, and that's a super complicated thing that we're trying to read and understand. So now here comes the story. And you can see maps human architecture in the top. So um, a few years ago, I got promoted. Um, like, I don't know. I like it. Yeah, I thought I, we had kids, so I thought it'd be good to get more pay. I, I didn't really process the fact that to be given more pay, I'd need to take on more responsibility. So um, I got told, congratulations, you've been promoted. Um, you now need to look after a team that you used to be in. So I was still a consultant. There's some people from the team in the audience. Um, I was still a consultant, not at ThoughtWorks, another company. Um, so I had a day job, but I also had to be like line manager of 39 people, and then we had to hire a lot of people, so then when I left, it was like 80 plus, plus a day job. But this is cool, because my boss, who left to go to ThoughtWorks, so you can read into this story what you want, um, he went, this is cool, we'll have a three-hour handover session, and I will tell you in three hours what you need to know to run a team of 39 people while doing a day job. He ran even more people, so I was like, this is this can't be fine. So the mind map, this is a real photograph. I don't think this is going to get me in trouble, but I don't, don't take photographs of it. Um, <laughs> the mind map is what he'd mapped out for what he needed to tell me. Because in his head, it was like super organized, right? And he knew these were the jobs he had to do. These are the things he had to worry about. The scribbling is me panicking for three hours over the top of it, going, I have no idea how this is going to work. Philip Marsden, exclamation mark, right? I didn't, I'd never met Philip Marsden, but now I had to like spend hours a day talking to him and all this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so then on the way home, I phone my wife and say, I think there's been a terrible mistake. We should possibly consider changing careers or something because I, I have no idea how this is possible. And so she said to me, 
But you're an engineer. You deal with like complicated stuff that's dumped on you in the space of three hours, and then people leave, right? Someone, you know, we get brought in as a consultancy. Someone's leaving. You've got three hours with them, and then they leave, and they're the one person who knows everything about the code base. You do this all the time. And I was like, yeah, I do. I like draw pictures. So I thought, I'll draw a picture. A little bit of science stuff. Problem is, the typical way of drawing pictures sucks. So that's all ganograms, right? Or like org charts. I didn't need to draw an org chart. All I needed to know was what my responsibilities were. And then the other kind of ways of, that I knew of that didn't kind of really work, apart from one, and this is what this is called. It's called circles and rolls, and it comes from halacracy. Halacracy is a whole big thing. There's loads of stuff. I think it's a bit over-egged, but it's a new way of looking at things, and ostensibly it removes hierarchy. But what it does is it makes hierarchy kind of movable and not fixed and structured. And what it has at the core is this concept of roles and circles. A role is something with a purpose, a set of accountabilities, and a, set of, and a domain. So the purpose is like why you're there. So if you're a developer, your purpose might be ship-tested features frequently to prod. The accountabilities are keep the build green, you know, keep the work in progress low. And the domain might be if you're building and running it, the running code and the code, you know, like the, the, I don't know, the build server and the, and the source control things. Roles sometimes get too big. So therefore, if a role gets too big, you split it up into multiple things and you group them together as a, in a circle. The key thing is one person has multiple roles. So what I thought I could do is I could take this massive thing, this like massive mind map of stuff, and just map that onto roles. So that's what I did. So start number one, there was one single role, which was me doing my new job. And I dumped everything in the role. And then all I did without changing stuff, but just like you do when you read through a code base, I just read through it and went, what are the kind of, how does this all group together? What are the responsibilities I now have, the accountabilities? What is the purpose of these things? And I kind of split it up and I ended up with this. So there's loads of them, right? So they're kind of obvious things. Like training, I had to like approve training requests. So we'll get back to this. But um, I get told, you have to approve training requests. That's, my, that's how that was described. Career guides, so we had to like, like where I used to be, where I got this like really well-organized, kind of delegated um, career progress mechanism. So we had people who kind of looked at that. Marketing, so um, we did things like sponsoring DevOps. So we then it turned out like we were developers, but we had to like figure out how to make t-shirts and like blog appropriately without swearing and all this kind of stuff. Gig management, getting people onto projects and all this kind of stuff. So it's all still me, but I'd mapped out what I did. And then I could share it with the team, right? So then I could say, this is what you should expect me to do. If I'm not, shout at me. Then I kind of at least had stopped it being a pull mechanism and it was a push mechanism. So some tips for doing this. Number one, don't overestimate the un existing understanding of how the org works. So I don't mean, I mean like this with you and your colleagues. Like I genuinely thought I understood what my boss did until three hours of a meeting and then it turned out I had no idea what he did. Um, if you use circles and roles, it's a map of existing power and influence. So we'll come back to that. Openness builds trust. I shared this with the team, as I said, so that people could go, you know, it's, it's still all the stuff I have to do, but at least you know that these are the moving parts of the stuff I do when I disappear for two days a week. Um, no, another one, you don't need to be in charge to do this. I wished I'd done this before to just speak to my boss and went, how, you know, what are the things that you have to do to, to, to run the team? Just so I kind of had an understanding of the various bits of, of the team. And by doing so, you'll learn loads. So I kind of helped other people learn a bit by sharing it. And the most important thing, and again, we'll come back to this, what you can see, you can change. But we're not talking about change at the moment. We're just talking about mapping it out. So next. Right, number two. Read the dynamic system. So if we're going back to code land, we've just drawn like a big class diagram or a component diagram or something. Um, view of things, right? We don't have a dynamic view of the system. And as we all know, the static view of a system is typically not a great way of figuring out how it really works. What you need to do is flow some execution through it, flow some load through it or something to figure out what it really works, where the hotspots are, where the redundant, irrelevant bits are that nothing, you know, never get called. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So the next story is um, we're going to go into the training bubble. So remember I said that um, in the training thing, uh, I had to approve training. So I had in my picture ahead, which where I was the cop emoji, and... Um, this sounded cool. So people would send me emails. I imagined all of this, right? Apart from the bit with the tick and the cross. Um, emails would come to me uh, and I would be like the benevolent dictator and I would have all of this kind of information at my hand, fingertips, and I would say yes or no. And I would then forward on the email to finance, which was the people I had to send this email on to. And that sounded awesome. Unfortunately, it was more like this. So um, 
so number one, and this is how this is, so, so number one, people would send emails, and they were beautiful, and they were clean emails, and they'd give you all the information you needed. Sometimes they didn't. And then sometimes they didn't. I'd have to email them back and say, well, you haven't told me where the course is. It could be in San Francisco, in which case I'll say no, but if it's in London, I'll say yes. Chatter. Also, nobody emailed. People would just send me chat messages. So there's, there's a one way to tell when someone's been promoted if they haven't told you, because behind IntelliJ IDEA, they've got like 17 chat windows flashing as people are asking them random quick questions, <laughs> which is not bad. Like you kind of get used to it, but your entire mindset changes, so that, you know, which is good. You want to kind of be in touch with people and know what's going on, but it's, it's different. So you'd, people would be asking questions and asking for approval over chat. But also, the loud hailer, sometimes Pivotal would come to management and say, you're a new partner, we've got some free training, who wants to go on free training? So then they would say, I don't know, I'll ask Andrew, he looks after the Java team, and then I'd have to ask people, who wants to go on the free pivotal to train? This is all very good. Um, this was massively overwhelming, because I still had a day job. So what I would do was, I would batch things up. So once a week, I would look at my inbox and try and figure out which were the relevant emails, and go through them. Unfortunately, sometimes I wouldn't get to them, and they already ex would have expired, so the training course would have happened by the time I got to process an email which sucks, right? So you asked, I would have said yes. Sometimes I think I may have actually replied saying, yes, you can attend this training course to someone who requested a course that had already happened. That may have happened, may have happened, I'm sorry. So that was bad, so I felt bad. So I thought, I need to think, oh yeah, there you go, so now I'm confused and not happy at all. Um, so think like a developer, what am I gonna do? Is this what I need to, uh, need to do? Um, so I thought, this is, I'd read some books about trust-based organizations, much to the, horror of people who uh, were in the team. And I was like, this is, this is a really easy way to do this because I'm just a, a, you know, a middleman in the process. What People requesting training know far more about the training and their skill sets than I do. I could just automatically approve every single training request. <laughs> and then, and it got better. I, at one point, thought I could just get people to send their training request directly to the next step in the chain and CC me so that if I was asked if I knew about it, I could say I did know about it. But I would just be nothing, you know, they wouldn't even have to wait for me to forward stuff on. This was awesome. Now we're going to talk about making the right change. Because it turns out making changes in systems is not that hard. Making the right change in the system is the key thing. That's what we'll talk about now. Um, so this is what happened. And it worked. What I just showed you worked for at least a month. So it was really cool. For one month, I was like super productive. Lots of the, the kind of running the team stuff was pretty much proving training requests when it came down to it. And planning, finding people to do t-shirts for DevOps. Um, I was just looking at my part of the process, right? The poor lady in finance, and it was a lady in finance, but I don't think she was this old. Um, she was now getting bombarded with all of the stuff that I was, all the unfiltered stuff that I was getting sent, she was now being sent. Right? So she had zero context. I had quite a lot of context, but now this person is going, these all seem to be auto-approved, but I don't know if a blockchain conference or spring training or knitting training, she had no frame of reference as to whether or not, she works in finance, right? So like profit and loss and all this kind of stuff and bouncing the books she knew tons about. She had no idea if the randomly named developer coolness, like Spark, is that fake? I don't know if Spark is fake. Scala sounds like it's not been made up. Kotlin? What's Kotlin? They had no idea what all this stuff was, right? And they'd Google it and they'd get even more confused. So, um, so I hadn't got rid of the problem of doing all of this stuff. I just passed it down the road and made it someone else's problem. But they were, God bless them, they were trying to solve this problem. And they were trying to find out and trying to, to figure out what was going on. But then, so then that wouldn't necessarily be a problem for me. It was still a problem for me because this is now taking even longer and I'm now one degree removed from what's actually happening and the decision process. So now I'm getting my inbox filled up with even more, and this is before I figured out threading and Outlook email, even more requests or, or follow-ups from people in the team going, what happened to my training request? I don't know what's happened because they assume that I'm still doing it. So I'm still getting loads of email and the finance people are hating me and it just turns out to be a disaster. So life was bad. So again, I thought like a developer. So if you look at this from a development perspective, um, there's like a million things wrong with it, right? So I was a bottleneck. That was the correct diagnosis, right? But what I'd failed to realize was um, I was a bottleneck, but I did provide a valuable resource, right? And the valuable resource that I provided was, and I think I've got a picture of it, 
in helping people request complicated training, like training which wasn't... So typically when you joined the company or when you kind of leveled up to a certain, you know, you got promoted, there would be certain sets of training we would want you to go on. So like spring training, we did loads of spring, go on spring training. So that's in the green tick, right? Request spring training, it's a standard already known training provider, et cetera, et cetera. But we also wanted people too. I wanted, I never got this approved, but I wanted someone... Someone asked, and I wanted them to go on, a blockchain conference on a cruise ship around the Caribbean. <laughs> that's not a joke, that's true. We didn't get the business case through, but I wanted to spend my time helping that person write the business case, because I was like, if we can get this approved, this is amazing. Then suddenly we're working for an entirely different kind of team. Um, so for that, there was a different kind of um, interaction profile between me and the person. So what we did was, when I redesigned the system, we had two flows. Right? Just like you might build a, build a software system. So we clearly listed out the kind of standard stuff. This is a standard training request, right? And we even came up with tags so that you could flag it as standard. So it still went past me, but it went straight to the to, to, to finance people. Um, they uh, could see that it was tagged standard, so they just they trusted us, but they knew that they weren't trusting us for everything because then they also had the complicated stuff coming through as well. So they knew that we weren't trying to pull the wool over their eyes. So that just went straight through, and I kind of got CC'd on it. More important stuff would go to me. I was happy. We would have a chat and I'd help you write the business case or whatever. Or if we were to add a new training provider or something, all good. Then I would send it to finance, but still appropriately flagged. And finance now would sometimes, they'd still have questions, but then it was good because we could have a contextualized conversation and we might have the request plus the business case plus some kind of toing and froing from me and it was good. So people understood it. So that's the right change. So I've grouped the tips together for these two because they very much go together. Dynamic stuff is important and systems are important, but like reading the system is important. So, number one, see the power of a small change. So this, this, um, you can read about this in books. Like one of the big things in the goal, if you've read the goal, or even in the Phoenix Project, which is basically a ripoff of the goal, they don't go and change tons and tons of stuff, but they change a few things one at a time and do things. And that's the thing, they do the right change. So they change the right thing, not the wrong thing. And this is super key. They give it time to manifest because... You know, like you, if you think about load testing, we do this all the time with load testing, right? We poke, poke a bunch of load at something, something goes slow, we tweak it, then it goes faster. But if we run it on a soap test, it turns out that it's going faster, but it's now backing up somewhere further down the system, which then like, makes stuff run out of memory and everything falls over and it's a disaster. You've got, to, like, you've got to let stuff bed in to figure out how long it takes. And to do that, you've got to observe the whole dynamic system, like end-to-end, -end, from the start point where the person in the team decides they want training and they send a request thing, all the way through to not just approval, but back to kind of like the person booking the course. Because what you want to do is observe the impact on the goal. What we wanted was people to go, I'd love to do this training course, and so I can now rapidly get a yes or a no, and book on the course, and sit on the course, and get more knowledge, right? Me having more time to be a consultant was not the goal. It was what I'd like, but it wasn't the goal of the system, right? So big things that you, I learned, maintain quality. Some, but quality is sometimes not equally distributed. So therefore, some simple stuff, it was easy to trust people and it would just be a high-quality training request. Other stuff, you need to help them. And then watch out for feedback. So like I say, the, the arrows going back the way, you know, like back pressure and everything. Again, there's loads of this stuff in, in software. This totally applies in the real world. Yet as developers, we seem to miss it all the time. I missed it for years. So that's the next one. So this is... This is my favorite one, I think, Kill Consensus, because it's the best title. Um, when I was trying to come up with a story for this talk, I spent ages trying to come up with the best example of, of horror story of consensus. Um, but I gave up because I realized we all wrestle with consensus and, and its um, close cousin and immediate knock-on effect, gigantic meetings which go on forever and nobody can ever come to any conclusion. We all have this on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And it's the bane of developers' lives. So I'm not going to tell you about, about meetings, which are, you know, there's good meetings and bad meetings. 99.5% of meetings are to gain consensus, and they're the ones that I'm talking about now. So consensus, we just, because that's how we do things, right? Meetings are, are how we gain consensus. So, um, which leads to this joke, and I've been in pre-pre-meetings... Pre, so like this is actually because consultants we like to make sure we don't look like idiots in front of customers. So we'll check because they've called a pre-meeting because um, you have these in coffee shops a lot. 
They've called a pre-meeting so we can agree with our stakeholder, but then we'll have a meeting before the meeting with a, with a key stakeholder to make sure that we're going to look good in front of the stakeholders so that when we go with the stakeholder to his stakeholders, we all look good. Like, not a joke. This actually happens. People talking for ages, stand up and all this kind of stuff, and all these, these horrible things. Um, yeah. It gets worse, all right? Because, because we're using meetings to get consensus, and we therefore want, you know, a, a consensus pretty much gives all of us the opportunity for it to be nobody's fault because we're all agreeing, so it's all of our fault, which means it's nobody's fault. So if we have this, then we can, um, uh, you know, we, that means we just need to get the right people in the room and the right information. That means that the meeting probably gets pushed down, like three months down the track, because we want to get all the key decision makers in the room, and they're all busy, so that means that we, and we need a three-hour meeting, right, because we want to cover all of the topics in the meeting. That's, you know, so then even if you eventually do get all the right people in the meeting and have all of the right information and everyone miraculously agrees and we all just go, that's still three months waiting for a three-hour meeting and all of the people who are waiting for this decision are still blocked, right? Blocking is bad. So we're developers, right? This is a diagram which fills me with dread. This is a Kafka cluster um, trying to re-ascertain distributed consensus with Zookeeper, right? So the whole, like... Just I don't. I've never done this. I'm glad I've never done this. I know enough about Zookeeper to know that you should never do Zookeeper. <laughs> um, but so, that, so we have systems that do this, right? Typically, we don't build them ourselves. We download them. But we engineer systems. I spend ages engineering systems so that you can have as little consensus as possible. The more of a system you can build without consensus, the better, right? Because then we don't have to agree. I don't have to know what you're doing. You don't have to know what I'm doing. There's only a microscopic bit where we overlap. That's what we have to agree on, and everything else we just go our own way and just trust that the other person does it. But why don't we do this in meetings, right? You know, we're like the exact opposite, and we're really bad at this in development land. So, think like a developer. The reason I think we have these meetings is because there are other ways of doing all of the other things I've talked about in this talk. I genuinely think, this freaked me out when I heard about it, people... They don't know an alternative to having meetings and gaining consensus. So they just assume that's how it's done. And everyone in the Western world, maybe in different cultures, we don't. In the Western world, we do, right? There is an alternative, and it's called the advice process. And it's very simple. That's the rule. Anybody's free to make any decision. Um, that sounds a bit like chaos. How so, to, to not be like given into trouble, that's a Scottish phrase, to not be like given a row. Um, the person who makes the decision needs to seek advice from everyone who will be meaningfully affected, which is good, and they need to speak to people with expertise because there might be people who've got expertise who might now not be meaningfully affected, but you know they built the original system that's going to get ripped out. They managed to escape and went to another part of the project, but they know tons about it, so go and speak to them, right? And that's it. That's the advice process. If you Google it, there's a reading list later on, but if you Google it, there's a nice wiki page which pretty much says this, and then it's got a load of case studies because people go, there is no way that's going to work. But it does, and we'll get to how, it, how you can make it work in a second. So this is how to make it work. People are terrified about this, so what you need to do is experiment with it and prove that it's a good way of doing things if people follow the process, you know, the, the, the second and third bullets. And the best way to do this is um, super buzzword compliant, ADRs, architectural decision records. They're on the ThoughtWorks tech radar, which my ThoughtWorks get happy when I mention that. Um, but they're not a ThoughtWorks idea. So, but an architectural decision record is a really nice format, really short, really sweet, kind of you know, one-page or two-page document for there was a decision that needed to be taken, there was a problem. I looked at these various options, and then I decided that this was the decision I was going to take. These are the people I spoke to, and this is the information. Um, ADRs encourage you to, and so does the advice process. You don't need to agree with what people say, but it's your decision, so you own the responsibility. So therefore, you know, and this is a document of the record, a document record of the decision you made, because if these existed in projects that I went on to, life would be a lot easier. Because you always come along and you, like everyone says, why on earth have we got, I don't know, Kafka, or, you know, here when we could use something else, or why are we using Java when we could use Scala? The person at the time probably will have made the right decision based on the information they had at the time, based on the, 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 the pros and cons and all the information they had, because they don't have a crystal ball, they can't see into the future where you are looking back at them, judging them. So ADRs give you that, and advice process just unblocks it and just lets you get going. Consequently, you get better decisions, because I've made a decision because it impacts me and I'm the beneficiary, so, and I've spoken to the people. So I've been exposed, people know that I've made a decision, um, I'm living with it, I gain the benefits from it, 
So therefore, people set their own cadence. You don't get, you know, typically people think it'll be carnage because people run around making loads of decisions all over the place. They don't because people are a little bit risk averse, especially now it's them that's going to have their neck on the line for, for the decision that they made. So you get better decisions and they're written down so people can see them. So you'll see ownership, speed and transparency. And it like, I can't, can't stress this enough. You'll probably end up, when you adopt it, you'll end up having lots of meetings with management to make them believe that these things are happening. And then they read some ADRs and they're like, oh, crikey, I wouldn't have even thought of speaking to that person. So it's good. So now we get to step five. So step five, and I can't remember what my next slide is. Oh, yeah, no. So step five, you'll notice that I probably, if you're being a bit specific, which is what developers do, um, Everything I've talked about probably sounds a bit like a refactoring, like something specific, safe, you know, an individual intervention that you make to make something more explicit or clearer. What about the culture hacking? That's this, step five. Um, and what I'm going to do with step five is, because there's kind of like a mindset shift, which is beyond delegation, and I want to use that mindset shift and revisit the three things we've just talked about. So um, killing consensus looking at the dynamic system and making the right change and um, mapping the human architecture, I want to revisit those in light of going beyond delegation. So first we need to define culture. Culture is like, like so I tried, so I thought writing talks was easy in the past because you just need to define something so you Google it. There are very few good definitions of culture that I could find, but there's one by Edgar Schein in the Toyota way, which is where all the lean people get super carried away because it mentions Kaizen and, and Kanban and all that kind of stuff. But it's tons and tons of this book is about culture and people. And he says, culture is the pattern of basic assumptions that a given group has to cope with its problems. Stated another way, if the organization and the hierarchy and the structure and the process is like the solid bricks, culture is the bits that you use to fill in the gaps, right? And you can read a lot into culture. So like sometimes if everything sucks, but you just need to stay sane, the culture is humor, right? So the office. It's a classic example of the TV show, right? So they don't try and change any of the organizational hierarchy or anything, but they make loads of jokes about it to make them stay sane. But other times, there's like, you know, individual responsibility, um, trust, and all that kind of stuff. You get trust-based cultures. So this is the kind of the, the glue that fits in. And with that in mind, it calls back into question another of, you know, we started with the three statements at the start. We need to add a kind of opposite, the flip side, to point number two. So point number two was... Um, the best people to do make these small changes, continual changes, are the makers, developers. The question you always get asked are, and if you want to get your manager to watch this video, this is the slide to make them pay attention to, um, what happens to the people who are managers? Does that mean they've just disappeared and it's all like this you know, happy, hippie community where everything happens magically? No, there is still a significant reason to have managers, and that's this. Because you need help, right? You need a broader view which your manager has. You need to be able to set context. They are typically gatekeepers in lots of these processes. Um, they typically have access to lots of information. So what the manager can do is open up, just like I documented my, you know, the kind of circles and roles, opening that information up, making it clear and available to people is, the, is super important. And that turns out takes a lot of time. It's not a quick job. And clearly it's about power. So therefore, this is the, the thing. It's, um, there's a misconception. And the misconception is um, that lots of people get promoted because they want more power because they're power mad. I, from my experience anyway, and I, this is a personal sample and based on me as well, most people are terrified at the power and the influence that they have. And lots of the things that motivated me on this journey was like, I'm suddenly going to have to make decisions when I have no context and no idea of what the details situation is. I'm going to be a blocker. I'm going to just, you know, make everyone's lives worse. That feeling is all over the place. Most people who are managers or leaders or in some kind of bottleneck type position of responsibility will at some point in their career go, God, I just wish I just wrote code. Or like, you know, made Gantt charts or like organized Kanban boards or something. But they got given power and responsibility, and they're trying the damn level best to make the best of that for as many people as they can in the best way they can. So what this does is the power doesn't change, but it hopefully moves it around and gives it, hopefully, in a different way, into the hands of people who are best able to make the best use of that power. And that should be dynamic, right? It shouldn't end up in one place, because then you just end up with a shadow hierarchy, which is kind of even worse than a standard hierarchy, because there's no org chart which tells you who has the real power. 
and this is how to do it. So, when you get promoted in the old world, you go, this is far too much stuff. I can't possibly do all of this. You know, I can't do all of these things. What people will tell you to do is, that's fine, just, devol- just delegate, right? And you go, you go to conferences and you get talks on how to do delegation. Delegation is a failure. Delegation is where I have to approve training courses. Um, I hate Fitz, who's standing at the back, so I want to make Fitz's life terrible. So I'm going to give Fitz the responsibility of approving training courses. So this is awesome. I now have tons of my time back. We haven't fixed the problem. It's just we've moved it somewhere else. So now Fitz is having to approve all of those training courses. So his productivity drops and mine doesn't. He's still got, you know, as little context has to do as much work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He might be slightly politer when he, or more efficient when he replies to his emails than I am, but it's still the same problem. Because you've given the problem, but not the power to solve it. What you need to do is devolve power. Then you give the problem and the power to solve it, because you've given, you know, if you think about circles and roles, the accountability and the purpose and the responsibility and the domain, you own the thing, that then becomes a, belongs to the person. So devolution beats delegation. So now let's go back and look through things. So number one, advice process. So like I say, the people, if you really want advice process to stick, the first thing to do is either do it to yourself to make a manager feel more comfortable or convince a manager to do it. So I have rolled it out in the company I'm at at the moment and in projects that I'm on at the moment where I just did it. So I had to make a decision, but instead of just secretly going into a room or like making a snap decision, I would follow the advice process. I'd go and ask, to, ask all the people explicitly. I'd tell them I was working through the advice process. I would write it up as an ADR and I would share it. So they could see that we were doing things differently. So there were, I was role modeling what I wanted to see. And it's, the advice process is, as far as I've come across, there's probably loads of other ways to do it, but it's a super safe way to, to, to transfer power. Because if people transfer power, they typically, you know, they've got to build trust. But if they can see you documenting how you're exercising that power for them, then they'll be like, okay, cool. And they can give you feedback. Right, right, you should have spoken to that person. Right, good. That's your job still as a leader or a more senior person. You can see that that team in America has this input who I didn't know about because I'm on the ground. So then they can build it. And then I build my network as a person at the front line and I get all this stuff. Next one is right changes in end-to-end dynamic systems. Um, it makes the whole system visible to everyone. Reading systems, it turns out, so I did a biology degree slash psychology. Um, so this seemed blindingly obvious, although I never figured it out. It's maybe different for other people who come from different disciplines, but like the entire, you know, homeostasis, human society, all of these things work on massive feedback systems. You know, like the glo- global warming, by the way, gigantic feedback system. Um, so making the system visible is super important. So what you need to do is not just become the reader of systems. You need to teach people in your teams or your colleagues or yourself to read systems. And it will, it will make you a better performance engineer, guaranteed. It'll probably make you far better at diagnosing why something weird went wrong in AWS and Kafka and everything else. Um, and if you combine it with the advice process, you move towards proper Kaizen. So Kaizen is gradual improvement, but gradual improvement is not someone high up tells someone to do something differently. Gradual improvement through Kaizen is we think this sucks, we have taken responsibility to fix it, which is like and on cords, you know, stop the line, all this kind of stuff. That's it. It's not just like retrospective, right, where we put a bunch of stuff on sticky notes. And the last one is circles and roles. So I said you map it out so people can see it. Um, what you can start to do is you can invite co-owners. So instead of saying so and so is filling in for me while I'm away on leave, you can say, well, I'm away on leave. This circle is being fulfilled by this person. This circle is being fulfilled by this person. This circle is being fulfilled by this person. And then that's the gateway drug. So then you ask, say, to someone when you get back, did you like, like, because some, this is the thing that's bizarre to me. People love, like, doing marketing stuff. People even liked working with sales when I was at my old company because that meant they could work with sales, qualify bids, get better work, qualify out of stuff that wasn't going to be any fun. So if it was a massive COBOL code base, we could say to the salesperson who was, like, seeing 15 million pounds, we'd be like, it's a COBOL code base. Nobody has any COBOL skills and we don't want to learn it, so we're not going to do it. So people like to do this stuff outside of their day job or outside of the kind of their core competency. And so then the next bit is, then you go, right, so this whole circle belongs to you. If you think something's broken, you can fix it, right? So just go and do stuff. So the marketing thing, someone else took it over when I was in my previous company. They like started a podcast and loads of stuff. Um, And then the last thing is let hierarchy emerge because you don't get no hierarchy. You just get emergent hierarchy. So it needs to be dynamic. Again, if you're a person in a position of responsibility, you need to watch out for stuff becoming fixed and, and ossified. 
because that's just another shadow version of the old one. You want stuff to change and things. And so um, are these refactorings or hacks? Like I say, it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of the two. You put the two together. In my experience, the more if you are someone who has some of this power, and again, this is if you, know, if you are a manager or if you get your managers to watch this video, the biggest power is like a force multiplier. The more you're open, the more you're trust, and the more you just let people get on with it and mentor them and nurture them, which is far more fun than being the person who says yes or no to training requests, the better it will be. And it's like terrifying. And then interestingly, you go and, and it's not a talk by me if I don't mention Netflix. If you then go and look at Netflix, other like super high performing companies, Amazon, lots of people like that, they, they don't necessarily use these techniques, but lots of that kind of culture and ways of working and stuff is embedded in how they do things. So I said there was a reading list. This is your final reminder of the, of the five things. So there's number one, map the human architecture. I mentioned telacracy and circles and roles. Um, like I say, lots of the book feels like um, it's got completely over the top and it feels like Scrum++ plus plus with like loads of ceremonies and meetings and all that kind of stuff, but you can steal tons of it. The subtitle is wrong. It doesn't kill hierarchy. It just makes it dynamic. The middle two, um, this is where like, your entire life will change. So number one, you read Donella Meadows' Thinking in Systems. So which is amazing. So it gets kind of progressively more bonkers. It starts with like filling taps and thermostats and it gets into like global warming and the end of capitalism, which I think is quite cool because I work with ThoughtWorks. Um, but it's like it'll change the way you think about the entire world. You've read that, then you read the goal and you can like see all the systems thinking in place in the goal. If you've read the Phoenix Project, still read the goal. Um, if you read the goal and you get to the bit with the robots, um, me approving training requests, I was a robot. Um, Fifth Discipline is like a super thick book which could use half the words that it uses but is really good. Again, loads, lots of systems thinking but tons of other stuff like learning organizations and trust. And the Toyota Way is good because while 25% of it is about the stuff you've heard about from Lean, the other 75% is about people, culture, trust, case studies of how they like designed the Lexus and all this kind of stuff. And I thought it was super interesting as a developer. <clears throat> and then the last two, Kill Consensus and Beyond Delegation. Reinventing Organizations talks for about three minutes about Kill Consensus, and then it will blow your mind in a bunch of other stuff. But it's awesome. <clears throat> and also, it'll talk about kind of the delegation, or how alternatives to delegation. Turn the Ship Around is one of the few books where, there's lots of books that tell you what to do, and then tell you case studies of people who've done it. They don't tell you what it's like to get there. Turn the Ship Around is the story of, and he wasn't aiming for any of these things, he was just aiming to make things better the worst performing nuclear submarine in the US Navy, so massively hierarchical organization, probably quite risk averse to change, right, if they're a nuclear submarine. Um, L. Robert, Robert, David Marquet talks about how he basically kept enough of the structures of na naval hierarchy to make sure it still looked like a, like a naval, you know, ocean-going submarine while empowering every single person all the way through the hierarchy to do all of their job without having to get permission from seven levels above them. And there's tons of stuff in there which you just read and you're like, oh my God, that's like this blindingly obvious. And that's it. Oh, so then there's the thing. So I lied. Um, I didn't lie. I told the truth. But if I posted something on Facebook now, but you should delete your Facebook account, so don't put it on Facebook. Um, doing this is as much fun. So I kind of was stumbling around in the dark doing it by accident as a side effect and kind of stuff. Then I read loads of these things and now I'm doing it consciously. Like being a force multiplier for your colleagues and your team is super, super satisfying. So I would recommend that anybody tries it. And you can try, like I say, little bits. You don't have to try the whole thing. Does anyone have any questions? And tweet me. If you need to ask me questions, you can tweet me. Stunned silence. I've got two minutes left. That's good. Might get two minutes back. No questions? Right, cool. Thanks for coming. <laughs>